Here we are then, John, in your cottage in, in Fox, and you're still publishing. Um, first I hope so, yeah. Right. So <coughs> I suppose the first question really is, when did you know you wanted to be a, a writer? Oh, well, I suppose like everybody else who writes, it goes back a long way, almost to childhood, really, or very much to childhood, to being such an avid reader. Um, and obviously wanted to create stories of my own. Um, although I first thought I would like to write poetry rather than novels, um, but still it turned out to be novels. Um, and um, and I, I mean, I still went on writing poems, but, but the novels took over. And I mean, the, the two novels which started my career really were these, The Bargees and The Wedge. And originally they were one novel which I sent round to many publishers. And then one publisher said, we very much like the first part uh, of this novel. Um, and so that made me write it as a separate work. And that was The Bargees, which of course is about children. Um, growing up in the 1920s in the potteries during the, well, pre-depression really, or just about the time of the strike, I suppose, the national strike. Um, and um, that was the first one published in 1969. And um, I then wanted to complete the whole thing really. and. By that time, I had an agent, and the agent transferred me to a different publisher from Dents to, to, to W. H. Allen. And um, in the process, because Alan Silito was one of the directors of W. H. Allen, she got him to write a preface, which in a way was a bit ironic, because I had written partly in reaction against... I mean, I admired Alan Silito's novels very much really and all the other working class writers of the 50s and late, late 50s and 60s um, but my experience of working class life was a benign experience on the whole whereas they, they tended to present a very gritty and very um, dramatic picture of, um, of working class life and brutal at times as well and I didn't like that really and wanted to uh, you know bring uh, a bit of balance back to I, to well, that world yes it is a bit brutal at times though isn't it oh in, yes in, of in course there is brutality bit, really it's very, yeah it's a very glowing preface from, from um, so. but that was in a way my my purpose but I mean I was very grateful of course to Alan Salito for for writing the preface because it obviously did make quite quite a difference to the sales um, of of, the, of that novel. And they're both, aren't they, somewhat autobiographical, semi autobiographical? Yes, they're, they're very, very, very semi autobiographical, really. Um, I've written later um, the Maureen book, for example, which is much closer to my actual life and what I've recently written which I hope to publish soon is much closer to the, to my actual life I mean I deliberately made it more objective really and that was why I set it back in the 1920s because I didn't want partly I didn't want to have to talk about the war um, and partly I just wanted to get away from from my own experience. So in a way, I think uh, these two books, in a way, enshrine more of the working class life of my parents' generation um, th than mine. Well, yes, except, of course, that in The Wedge we do have this classic Hogarth sort of moving away from your parents and this upward mobility of yes, working class yes. parents and it talks about yes. your... Well, it's you going to Oxford, really, isn't it? Yes. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Oxford experience and how you how you found that and what that did in terms of, of well, separating you at all from working class life in the area. 
Well, I suppose it did separate me in many ways, but then there were very long vacations in which I'd always be back in Stoke-on-Trent and um, in Hanley and um, really resume the same life that I'd always had. Because um, my, my life had changed much earlier than, than university, really. Um, this comes out in, in the latest book I've written. Uh, um, not only did I have friends at, at grammar school who were on the same wavelength as myself, you know, interested in the arts and uh, music and so on, um, but I had a, a cousin who was very dear to me, who, who was uh, unfortunately suffered from a, a terrible disease which killed him at the age of 25. But he was very much into the arts and into modernism when he was in his late teens. And he was a great friend of Charles Tomlinson, the poet. And um, they together, when they were at Longton High School, um, you know, they formed a little group of like-minded friends who were very much into music and into the arts, uh, into... I mean, in my uh, cousin's case, into architecture, Le Corbusier and all that kind of thing. And, you know, the whole modernist world opened up for me when I was about 15 or 16 through them. Um, and in a way, by the time I went to Oxford, because I'd already done national service, where I'd also met lots of people who were going to Oxford or Cambridge or wherever, um, um, in a way, I was already very much bound up in, in the world of the arts, really, before I went. Mm. And so it didn't, make, it didn't make a great difference to me in that sense. When you were a, a child here, presumably you had the experience of going to concerts at the Victoria Hall, you had cinema right. here, all oh, of that yes, was on your doorstep? North Staffs Film Society uh, and the concerts at Victoria Hall were very important to me um, during that period of late teenage. Um, and as I say, by the time I went into the international service, I was a different person anyway, because, um, I mean, another, I don't know whether you call it a small item, is that my accent changed, of course. I mean, my, my mother had always brought us up to speak properly, as, as mothers do. My father was an educated, a self-educated man, and he could speak properly when he wanted to, but he chose, partly for political reasons, to identify himself with working class, and he would use working class language and local dialect whenever he could. Um, so um, I was quite used to that. I just think that's very important, your father, oh, and the, the Marxist, in fact, yes, yeah, it's, uh, course, the yes, politics, yes, which yes. actually does yes. sort of go right through your, right. your books, yes. those attitudes. Yes. Yes. Well, that must have been difficult in North Staffordshire at times, having a Marxist father. Oh, it was, yes, it was, really, because um, everybody... I mean, my father used to call Potter's people lousy but loyal, and they were. Um, you know, they they would have been horrified, I think. I mean, he was fairly discreet, except with his pals at work uh, and when he was in the pub. Um, he was quite discreet about it, and I don't know that our neighbours realised that they had a Marxist in their midst, you know. And then you mentioned me also using dialect, and dialect is something that you do use quite a bit, certainly yeah. in those two books. Do you, I mean, yeah. try to say something about the use of dialect in novels at all. And I mean, obviously we've had it a little bit in Bennett, but we've had it in Victorian novels. Well, of course, one wants, in a way, to try to preserve it. I mean, that's what, partly why, why it's there, because there is this feeling that it's being lost all the time. And, um, and obviously, a lot of people um, in this area, there are remnants of it all around us, but it's all in bits now, really. It's all very fragmentary, and, and it's, it's no longer really... You can't say that people speak the dialect. There were two men lived in this village 
when I first came here in 1987. One lived in the house next door, um, and he was uncle to a man who I lived next door to up at the crossroads. And um, they, if you heard them speaking together, together it was the genuine article of North Staffordshire. Not potteries, but local country North Staffordshire. And it was marvellous to hear, really, because it was so consistent. But now you only hear bits of it. And, of course, I did want, in many ways, to preserve it uh, as far as possible, because it was such a feature of my childhood, really. And, again, counterpointed this move to get away from it and to speak properly. And then at school, we had teachers from the south of England, who, you know, by the late 1940s, the, the older teachers who were themselves from the potteries were beginning to give way to this new flood of, of southerners who were coming. And, um, yeah, like you. And um, um, they, um, they, it was two of them who... Start, uh, who started doing Shakespeare in the school plays because um, there was a tradition of school drama and I just came in at that moment when they decided that they were going to do Shakespeare and Shakespeare had to be spoken properly. At this stage, John, could it perhaps read the opening section of the Bargees because yes. I think it sets the scene up here. I mean, I've read everything of yours and it's difficult sometimes to remember what's where. In fact, i I bet you have difficulty remembering some of what you've written since 1969, oh, but I think yes, the opening I, section of I that does does set that does set the scene um, that we're talking about, and then perhaps we can talk about the sort of novels you think you're writing. But that that first page, perhaps, if you wouldn't mind. Having got out of school early that day, Ernie and Sheila ran down the back way to the canal over bumpy cobbles. They peered through the keyholes of gates to see what was going on in people's backyards. Nearly always the same things were going on. A spotted dog barked at a shut door. A baby in a pram lay blotting its eyes out. Tiny fingers spread like worms to the sun. Nasturtiums flamed from an old sill sink, and a lady in black crept towards them with a trowel. In many yards, mothers whisked their dolly pegs through the washing and raised sud smells. In the end of the entry, the children came to its street, where there were two, two potteries. One of them had green hooters along its roof and a lanky black chimney above. Behind wiry, frosted windows, green-white ghosts whirled clay into crockery, the potters quick at their wheels. In the potbank yards, horses and carts creaked and tinkled, waiting for their loads of waste. Ware, broken, unglazed and badly fired. The other factory was for lithographers, who seemed to be working nearly in the dark when one peeped in out of the bright sun. This building had a black steeple with a clock that told the time to tea and knocking off not prayers. On the other side of the wall, work girls sat, some elderly, on crates of plates and jugs and wash basins, and had a smoke in the afternoon heat. The canal cut out a green band just in front of them. They threw biscuit crumbs and fag ends to a group of swans, swimming slowly with oils and chemicals on the water. Tanned men in vests, shoveled at coke beside the bottle ovens, feeding the kilns mouths of fire. As the men plied, their armpits showed gleaming curls. The dirt bank along the canal also had a vest on of splashed china clay. The sun glittered on porcelain, glass and water, and drew up whiffs of turpentine and crate wood from the baked earth. Which is very much the potteries as they were that we've lost now, but a little bit of the countryside there, nasturtiums and the swans were there. So I'm just wondering, I, I remember 
both those books and they have an urban setting but they are also very much out in the country yeah. and there's a lot about flowers and animals. Mm -hmm. So how would you define the sort of novels you think you've been writing in this first group? Are they, I mean, they're realist novels, but they are novels of place, are very much a sense of yes, place, would you say? Place, yes, yes. I mean, it is a very special place, Stoke-on-Trent, isn't it, really? Or certainly was. I mean, it's no longer special, really. But, I mean, it was made special by the particular industry which, you know, it centred on. Um, I mean, there is something extraordinary about the contrast between the, the humble squalor, really, of many people's lives in the back streets and all that, and the actual work that they were doing in the potteries, you know, that beautiful designs that they had to put on the crockery and all that. Um, it is strange. I mean, it's so different from where, you know, where there's heavy industry, different from mining or steelworking or whatever, although we had that too in the potteries. But um, the actual pottery industry did make it a very different place somehow. Mm. Um, the, other thing, the other thing that um, is, you talked about the arts in general and painting and music, but the other thing that's very apparent as you read these novels is your love of cinema, and in particular, of particular female stars. That's the silent movie stars, and there's the Joan Crawfords and the Rita Hayworth. Can you? Is that something that's particularly important because they keep popping oh, yes, up through the novels? Oh yes, of course. The uh, cinema was, I suppose. I mean, so, for so many people, particularly during the war, it was the great escape, wasn't it? Um, and all those. Um, stars figured tremendously in one's imagination, really. Um, and they were so powerful in a way that they can't be today, really, um, because they dominated the whole um, of that popular culture, really, didn't they? Um, whereas there are so many varieties of culture today that um, you can't quite imagine now how um, how they did influence one's lives. And they were all big names at the time, of course. Um, oh, while you were at Oxford, did you, how, how did you meet at Oxford that, that made an influence on your life or on your writing? Well, I don't think Oxford influenced me, except, of course, in, in the sense that I was doing a course in English literature and therefore I was very conscious of the whole tradition of English literature. I mean, obviously, all working-class writers are very conscious of having D. H. Lawrence in, the, in their background, really. All working-class writers really have D. H. Lawrence, or English working-class writers, one must say, have D. H. Lawrence in their background, don't they? I mean, they're, they're all writing with or against him in some ways, really, I suppose. They're very conscious of his presence because he was, he still is the most formidable of all working, you know, writers from the working class. Um, and But, um, I mean, that didn't figure very greatly, of course, in the Oxford course, which finished in 1832. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I was taken back and very conscious, really, of the hugeness and the richness of literature, not just English literature, but um, world literature, because obviously one was reading Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and all the rest of them at that time. Um, and um, how could one com possibly compete? One could only do what was what one knew and so I got to write about that working class world. I mean, I really wanted to write a book like this one, that's, which came that, out that, later. That's, that's interesting. Because, that's what I would have liked yes. to write all my life, well, a kind of historical about, fantasy yes, or historical novel. All, all the novels that were published commercially, if we like, um, the five novels, are all, um, they're either in the potteries or they're dealing with um, Something. real life if you like yeah. but since you've been self-publishing 
there's a whole variety of genres. It's yeah. almost like by self-publishing, you freed yourself from a certain restraint. Well, in restraint. a sense, I have, I think, really, because, I mean, that's what publishers seem to want me to be. Um, they did publish this one, but apparently um, there was a lot of um, who were hooing and hawing about whether to publish it. I mean, that story is about a visit to Malaysia, which is based on the fact that I had taught Malaysian students and then I went to, to see them. And, um, and so it's a travel book, really, but in the form of stories. Um, that, in a way, was the first attempt to get outside the potteries, really, um, and it was published. But you've done that well with Muslim Lover, haven't you? Because that takes you, the last That's section right, of that is very much, section. it yeah. could almost be published as a separate yes, uh, yes. book about India and well, your experiences there. Exactly, really, yes. That's right. But it did fit in with, with the general theme, really. So that, that's why it's included. And your love of Shakespeare has been covered because you've written a prequel to uh, Merchant of Venice. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, I just wonder, when you're talking about um, Lawrence and working class writers, another writer that you seem to be very fond of was John Cooper Poes, and I know you had a lot to do with the Poes Society. And is it not the case that you, you, you wrote a libretto for a Paris work? Oh, yes. For, uh, there was a member of the society, who um, Robert Carrington, who wanted to write an opera. And so um, I wrote this libretto for him. I don't know where it is at the moment. <laughs> I mean, I suppose he's still got a copy. Whether he's still writing the opera, I don't know, because that goes back to the 1970s, I suppose the mid-1970s. And one of your great friends, of course, was president, or is president yes. of the, of the yes. Paris Society. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, I mean, um, that's how I met him, that um, a friend of mine who knew him as well said, oh, you must meet Glenn Cavaliero because he loves John Cooper Post as you do. Um, yes, John Cooper Post, I suppose, lies behind the meetings. I mean, it's a very different way of writing altogether, but um, even so, that lies behind. The idea of doing historical fantasy always appealed to me very much, really. Under the libretto, that might be a good place to just ask if you could read one of your, one of your poems and just tell us where and when it was published, if you can remember. Well, it wasn't published, I don't think. I've hardly ever sent my poems out at all. But I thought you did say you, you wanted initially to be a poet. Yes, I would have liked to have been a poet, really, yeah. Anyway, this one is called Armistice Day. Um, and it was written, I think, some again, in the 70s, probably. Um, or about the 70s, anyway. Um, at a time when, on the Armistice Sunday, um, I happened to be in London... And there was a visit from an African head of state and the Queen took him to the um, Cenotaph. And, and I was in St James's Park at the time, so this is what it's about. Armistice Day, a world, it seems, at peace. Autumn is coasting down the Great West Road and homes in by red and yellow flares on James's Park. The families and couples are bright-eyed with unfamiliar cold, and scarves are flying with the leaves. The solitaries hold out shitten sleeves for doves and sparrows to command with beak and claw their brunch. Big-bellied big flags swag out. Some potentate from Africa is here on a state visit and accompanies the Queen when, bound in black, dead set of face, she sets her wreath of frozen poppies on the cenotaph. And there the white old heads that once were young and bullet-balled and helmeted, 
are bent in tentative prayer. They do not quite believe, although all's quiet now on western fronts. For in the east and south, the headwind forces drought and famine and the fear of famine and the internecine frenzy of the gods. At sudden gusts, the birds seek shelter in the trees, but find their havens skeletons of what they were, the leaves becoming memories and dust above the lake, and all the multitudes of Sunday London scattering like shrapnel, lost in no man's land. Which is very much takes us back perhaps to the Jew and the First World War. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can say something about, because in, in a way that starts the whole, what I'd call the Potteries Quartet, does it not? Uh, even yes, that's well, it, they weren't published in the order in which they were written. Well, they were published, I suppose, in the order in which they were written. It was my fault that I didn't start at the beginning, as it were. But it's another very important yeah. local setting, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and you, right. you've yeah. talked before about Trentham and its importance. Yes, <coughs> Tre Trentham Gardens um, permeated my life, really, because it was, uh, like the cinema, it was the great escape. I mean, it was like going to Hollywood, in fact, in, in the wartime or um, at the beginning of the war, because they just built the swimming pool then in the middle of the woods and there's still vestiges of it there and it was like going to Hollywood because there you could have tea or coffee or you know you could sit and watch the people um, swimming and diving because they had a diving board you know in different stages and this was so thrilling it was just like seeing something in America um, it was in American style, you know, it was a typical 30s American style edifice, really. And um, we were thrilled to go on the little train, again, of which there are vestiges in the woods at Trenton, um, to to the swimming pool. And, um, and Trenton itself then, I mean, the gardens in my memory were very, rather different from what they are now. I remember roses entwining, um, you know, arches, which uh, you don't see that There's, there's an arcade there now much with roses. Yes, there is. There was more of that then. I think probably the Edwardian gard gard gardeners weren't so bothered about keeping the Italian style going, you know. I think now the purists have taken over, as it were, and brought it back to what it was originally intended to be. But during uh, the period after the Duke of Sutherland left, and I presume the Stoke-on-Trent City Council owned it, I think, didn't they? Weren't well, they offered her? Um, well, it was offered for Keel, <coughs> wasn't it? It was offered for the university, and it was turned down. I'm not sure, anyway. Um, but what happened was that um, it was commercialised, of course, and the gardens were allowed to grow in a more English style, I think, really. And that's my memory of it. Um, so it was a wonderful place to go to. That's, I mean, that's the only point I'm really making, is that it was the escape route. And then, of course, I learned, uh, as I grew older, learned about the um, its history, um, and the fact that Disraeli set one of his novels there, in fact. Um, uh, now I've forgotten which novel it is. It'll come back to me. Um, and um, the, um, I mean, it was a tremendous show place in, in the 19th century, as it was for us in the 20th century. And it, in a way, was a people's park. I mean, you had to pay to go in, but it was very, very popular. There were mile-long queues at the buses in Stoke and Hanley and, and at Trentham when you were going home. It really was. And it was a, a thrilling place to go to. And it opened up to me all this previous life that it had had. 
And my grandmother, uh, who I didn't know, but my mother told me this, um, her mother told her about how she used to walk in the gardens with a, a boyfriend who was working on the estate and um, she walked in the gardens when they were just owned by the Duke, the Duke of Sutherland. And one day the Duke of Sutherland was there with a foreign visitor and they seemed to comment on her and her boyfriend and that stuck in my mind. Yes, but you have foreign visitors yeah, from yeah, Russia yeah, in here. Yeah. And the other yeah. thing you have... And there was a Russian prince living at yes. Kiel Hall. And that, that comes yeah. in. But you also, yeah. towards the end, there's this friendship <coughs> between these two men, one of whom um, occurs again later on. So one of your cats just... Sorry, I don't, um, where's she gone now? I don't know. She might hunt on that. Very important part of your books, the cats and the, the animals. <laughs> um, there's these two, these two men, a sort of... Um, a sort of homosocial bond in there. Um, but later on, there is the underground tree, which uh, I believe that's going to be the pit props, is it, the underground tree? Mm, that's right. Um, yeah. Which, I don't know, would you say that was a sort of breakout into a gay novel at all? Yes, yes, it was, yeah. Um, I mean, I certainly wanted to put a gay character in it. And, um, uh, I mean... He was very representative. I mean, by that time, of course, I was living in Brighton and working in Brighton, and um, he was very much a representative, as it were, of the gay world in Brighton, which opened up to me um, during the 1970s, particularly. Um, and so that, that's why this character appears there. And also... Um, I had an American friend and wanted to put an American character in into the novel. And also, of course, the American friend was put in because there were quite a number of American students then at Sussex University um, and other universities in Britain who were uh, escapees from the draft, um, you know, the conscription in, in the USA for the Vietnam War and that I wanted to bring in because it connected up so well with the leftist movements that were current with our students, you know, our own English students um, were very much into Mao Tse Tung and his Red Book and all that kind of thing um, that was going on at that time, 1968. So I wanted to connect up the um, the the Vietnam War and the left-wing students and all that kind of thing. And at the same time, keep my f feet firmly in the potteries. And so she has the experience that I had at Oxford of going home from... I mean, you can't say Oxford is a luxurious place um, because, I mean, um, physically one had quite as much to put up with from the plumbing and all that kind of thing, um, it were, you know, uh, as one had at home. Well, you describe you know, it as luxurious in, in the wedge, in a sense. It, it's, really it's luxurious in the sense that you can indulge yourself in whatever you want to do it at any time, more or less. You know, lots of concerts you know? and, and mm -hmm. plays and, and nice... Um, environment and all that kind of thing and then I would have to come back every vacation to um, so she has that experience going back from Brighton to the pottery which I was still doing very much in the 1970s and 80s because my parents were still alive and I was still going back to them uh, Brighton was a very liberating sort of place in, yes. many, in many ways yes oh yes well it is no doubt about it. Arnold Bennett thought so too. Well, he did a lot of writing down and he wrote about yeah, it, yes. Right, was that yeah. was that a model at all? I didn't um, think about it at the time. It only struck me later that Bennett um, uh, had a lot to do with writing. And you've talked about Bennett and you've spoken to the yeah. Bennett Society. Yeah, yes, so you, yeah. You've done quite a bit on Bennett yeah. and you talked about Bennett and dialect, yes. I seem to remember, in the Midlands. Yes, voice. I feel I had to pay, in a way, some kind of restitution to Bennett because we'd always been rather contemptuous of him um, you know as compared with D.H. Lawrence I mean we took up the Levisite position really 
and um, and Bennett was a popular writer and didn't have that kind of um, artistic command that that um, Lawrence and even Bloomsbury had, although they were a bit contemptuous of Bloomsbury because of Lawrence, really, um, because they ill treated him, or we thought they did. <laughs> well, that. we were talking, or you were talking about the, the <coughs> politics um, coming out in the underground tree in Vietnam. That's right, yeah. But there's a different sort of politics going on here. Yes, and I wonder I mean, why you decided to write about religion wisdom. rather than politics. Yes. Well, I mean, Muslims have made religion a central feature of our our lives again, haven't they? Really. And while I was in Brighton, I had a, a, a an affair. Well, it wasn't an affair. I mean, he was my permanent lover, really, for 20 years. And he was an Anglican priest, but he was an American. Um, and um, so... Um, and I met him because I had decided to um, be confirmed in the Church of England. That only happened because one of my students, a, wo a mature student, a woman, um, mature student, had just lost her husband. And I was very fond of her and very close to her. And she said, I, I, you know, she was seeking consolation in a way, and she said she'd like to be confirmed in the church. And I said, oh, I'll go with you. And that's what we did. And one of the people who um, taught us, as it were, who, um, I mean, he didn't really teach us, we, we just drank with him. Um, but the priest and this, you can't call him a curate, he was an assistant priest at the church, it was a very high church, Anglo-Catholic church. Um, he was the American. And one night, in place of the priest, he came and gave us the instruction, so-called, although it was mainly gin drinking. Um, and from that developed this relationship. So, I mean, I'm very interested in religion, always have been, but I've never committed myself. I did commit myself then, but you don't commit yourself very much with the Anglican Church. That's the, that's the beauty of Anglicanism, is you don't have to believe it, in a way. Um, and um, uh, it just suited me at the time, really. I mean, I don't go to church now. But my sympathies are still with the Anglo-Catholic community, really. And so I thought I'd write about a priest, since I knew it from the inside. I used to go with him to give pri private communions and things like that. Um, so I knew, knew the church from the inside, really. And I thought I would write about a priest who has this misfortune to find himself in love with a Muslim youth. Yes, and it's in the potteries as well. We need, need to emphasize. And I set it in the yeah, potteries yes. because I was very aware um, I mean, where my parents lived in um, uh, in Hanley, we were not far from Hanley Park, and I was very aware of the growing Muslim um, community that settled around Hanley Park, you know, and around the station, along with the students of your university. Um, and um, uh, I used to meet some of them in Hanley Park, when I was on vacation, I would go sunbathing there and met them. And um, so um, I was very aware of them, really. And um, I thought, oh, I must... Because I'd had a lot of Mus Muslim students as well when I taught Malaysians, because Malaysia is officially a Muslim country, um, I... Um, I knew a lot about Islam, and um, I was upset by, you know, the fact that it has become demonized so terribly, really. And in some sense, Muslim lover is an attempt to get back to some kind of reality about Islam. Um, I mean, you know, a pathetic attempt, perhaps, but that's what it is, really. 
And it has that lovely Indian section at the end as well, which I say is yes, just well, a separate that, book. That came about because I was at one time going to do a PhD on Commonwealth literature. And I went to India to visit. But again, I mean, I think this is a, a relic of Oxford. I think Oxford and Cambridge are terrible places in a way because they make people just be very self-indulgent. And I went to India, not really with PhD in mind, but with enjoying India. Um, Which you clearly did. Yeah, I did. And, and I thought, well, I must write about... Well, to be fair, the, ma the man I was going to do the Commonwealth Literature um, PhD with as my was Lawrence Lerner, the poet, who was at Sussex University at the time. And he said, oh, John, you've written novels, you don't want to write a PhD. Yeah, right, of course. Um, yeah. So, oh, the, the, actually, so this is my PhD. It is with 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 the uh, an, uh, an untypical PhD cover. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you have told me before about your friend. Perhaps you could just talk about Timothy Hyman's response to this cover. Well, uh, well, yeah, Timothy Hyman is um, uh, an art artist and also an art critic, and has recently written a very fine book about um, representational art, um, and he. Um, said he wouldn't normally allow a book with a cover like this in his house, but he had to because it was from me. Um, and everybody has commented on the awfulness of the cover. Um, to be fair to the young man who designed it, I mean, I was ill at the time and couldn't do much about it, and he <clears throat> obviously thought the novel would sell with that cover um, yes. and it hasn't sold at yes. all because I haven't let any of it go out because I was frightened having my head chopped off. Just the association of homosexuality with Muslims would have been enough at that time when it came out because that was when ISIS was at its height. Um, that would have been enough to have my head chopped off because mm. that so they're still up there in, in no, my I loft, think, I, I think waiting, waiting for the public. Well, we did talk about the cover, because actually the covers of the, the Wedge and, and the Bargees are actually really rather beautiful, because they do encompass, yes. The, yes, certainly the do. whole idea of the pottery. There's they pot do. banks That's there, right. there's steel works on That's it, right. as well as the central characters. Yeah. And Ernie on the front of the Bargees is very much as one would imagine him. Yeah. So I think you're very lucky with those. And I think this one was by a famous artist? On, on the way. No, he's supposed to be, was well known then, Val Biro or Byro. Mm. He was right. a well known illustrator. But since then, as you say, you've been self publishing, and one of the ones that you've done is the, uh, well, it's your Shakespearean player. That's right. I wonder if you'd like um, to say a little bit about what, well, well, why you ever wanted, why you desperately wanted to do a play. I wrote a preface to that. I mean, I had been studying it with. Um, uh, with a WA group or the Keel University group and um, uh, it struck it always struck me after I saw um, Jonathan Miller's production of it of of the Merchant of Venice uh, the old Vic I think it was um, and Joan Plowright was um, not really the ideal Porsche but and Olivia was um, Shylock, um, but he present John um, Jonathan presented the um, production as if um, uh, Jessica did not want to be taken from her father um, because he associated it with Rigoletto by using music from Rigoletto. He put this gloss on on the play. Because in Rigoletto, the daughter is abducted. I mean, she she's raped, really. But, I mean, Jessica is not raped. She goes willingly. But I always wanted to restore Jessica to her father, really, after that. I thought it would be a good idea to write a play in which they come together. And, of course, when I was studying this, because I was doing a course on Venice, it was not um, not a course on Shakespeare, and 
obviously the other Venetian play is Othello, and so I brought the two together in, in that. And you say, you mentioned her at WEA, and actually that turns up as well in, uh, in the Wedge, because you did work up here at Keele, right, Adult yeah. Education and yeah. WEA. That's the thread that runs through my life, really. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's so, right. So while we're on those books then, <clears throat> um, let's go to the Maureen book, Maureen and, and, and Art. Well, that's a very personal book, really. Um, and it deals with very personal subjects, very bodily um, subjects, yes. if you like, and, and, and death and dementia, That's end right, of life, yeah. which are things, obviously, one thinks about as you get older. Oh, well, yes. Well, at the time I wrote it, it I had an aunt who um, was demented, and um, I was having a lot to do with her, really, and, and um, so that, it, that came into it, and... Um, and also, um, I was remembering my um, childhood friend, June, who lived next door, and she mattered a great deal to me when I was a little boy, and um, she became Maureen. But she didn't get dementia, as far as I know. She has died since, but I don't think... But her mother did. Um, and so, I mean, I was, you know, we were, we were becoming very aware of dementia then. And I wanted to record my memories of June. And so I thought a good way of doing it would be to intercut the two periods, the 1940s, the war time, with um, later times, the 1980s and 90s, when this was being written. So that's, that's really how it came about. And again, it was going back to the world of the canal. Which is your photograph. own photograph, isn't it, of the, yes, the canal on, right. on the cover? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I like that photograph. Um, and it does bring it all back every time I see it, really. And right now you're still you're still writing, still um, publishing. So uh, you have something. At that time, I hadn't really put these two things together. At that time, I was writing a series of stories, which were trying to recapture childhood as far as I possibly could. I mean, just to get everything down in a way that I could re remember, and um, and those stories which I couldn't use in this which were nothing to do with Maureen, I am now, I've now written as a different kind of story, which is like an autobiography, but it's only in chunks of story, really, not a continuous thing. Right. So I know, I know we, we meet quite regularly and we, we chat in the pub and we have, we have wonderful arguments as well, and your memory is very good because you're always telling me your names of people you've met, yeah. Richard Burton's of this life, you mentioned Joe right, Flower, right? and, and people that you've seen that makes yeah. one very envious, yeah. but uh, you've obviously had a very rich sort of cultural life. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, that comes into this new, new book, really, um, because there were two, extraordinarily enough, there were two relatives who made an enormous difference to my life, doesn't normally work out that way. It's usually friends who who make these differences. But as I say, that cousin, Ronnie was his name, he's called Clive in the, in the book, because I think his second name was Clive. Um, he was uh, he was a wonderful person, really. Uh, it's hard to explain. The poor man had to suffer so much from this. His organs were... Um, diseased um, but he he was a wonderful personality um, he put up with so much and was always sunny in disposition really and then later um, when I was in the forces and then at Oxford I met up with a figure who had been a kind of legend in my lifetime a French aunt Going back to the view, one of my uncles was blinded in the First World War and at St Dunstan's he met this French girl 
and eventually they got married. So I had this, and she came from a very rich family. So I had this sort of mythical family in the background. And they used to send us clothes, beautiful clothes, and toys and things that their own sons had grown out of. And, um, and eventually I met her, and she became a very important influence on my life, really, when I was 18, 19, um, and on, on into, well, into my 40s, really. Um, so, and that will come out in, the, in this other book. And is there more to come? I have a half of a, a historical fantasy, which is very sadomasochistic. So I don't know whether shall I ever publish it, really. Well, this is a private interest, is it? This... <laughs> no, well, not really, no. But um, it, it, for some reason, it turns out to be in the in this novel. Um, it's uh, well, it again. It goes back to my interest in religion. It always, particularly, goes back to the origins of Christianity, and. I mean, the same would be true of Islam. The origins are so different from what has been made of them. And that, you know, is fascinating to me. Why have people created a whole edifice of religion on top of this little story? It is extraordinary, really. I suppose the other big interest, though, from my reading of your books is animals and from knowing you mm. animals almost as much as people would you say oh well they are just our characters yeah yes they are characters in the novels um but that's how i see them really i do i can never see any creature as anything other than equal to myself really because you do there's there's i remember right at the start is it of the Bargees, there's the killing of the green finches and elsewhere there's the, the love of cats and, and animals and that presumably is also part of the attraction of India would, mm. would be that. Yes, I sometimes think I miss my vocation. I shouldn't have been a writer. I should have been devoted to animal welfare, really. Well, that's what you do now, isn't it? Because yeah. half your chips from our pub lunches come back to feed the wild animals, don't they? Yeah. I mean, I haven't been a successful writer, really, so... Uh, no, no, I, let, let's, let's, let's I, argue about How would you define a successful writer? Because I do know that you you have been mentioned um, in that, the Oxford Companion, isn't it, to literature. You're there as a, mm, you're yeah. there as a realist writer. Yes, along with Stanley Middleton. Yes, so yeah. I, I don't know what, how you... Well, that's interesting. How would you define successful writer? Because on the table we have what, ten books, another one being published. Alan Silato has recommended you with a glowing preface, and you're saying not a successful writer. Well, I mean, they obviously haven't sold all that. I mean, that, that's how you know you're successful, isn't it? really. Um, I mean, I'm successful in in that they're done. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people start a novel and don't finish, do they? Um, but, but at least they're finished. So they're successful in that sense. But I mean, um, I just gave up on trying to... Um, I mean, I was a bit unfortunate in, in the uh, agent that I had. She had a breakdown at a most inconvenient moment from from my career's point of view. But, I mean, I can't blame her, her for that. Um, but it was unfortunate. And um, I, I found it difficult then to g find publishers after that. So, I mean, all those that were published, obviously published as a writer from the provinces, from the potteries, but I would have liked to have published, apart from that, that was the only one that wasn't to do with that. But I would like to have been more recognised for these. But how could it be when they're only self-published? Mm. Well, I mean, is this a, 
a problem of, of ageism now with publishers and, and writing? Maybe, or I don't know really. I mean, I just, um, I just sort of backed out of it. I haven't tried any, any publishers with anything. Is this why you live in Fox though? Because I don't I, quite know how you go about it now. I mean, the internet changed everything. You know, you just send them now on email, don't you? Which I haven't got into the habit of doing. Well, you don't, you don't answer, you don't do emails. It's, I'm very lucky if you pick up the phone, yeah. so that's yeah. not surprising. Yeah. But I mean, having, having had that exciting life and travelled abroad and, and taught in Brighton, how, how come that we're back in this lovely little cottage in this small village in the Staffordshire Moorlands? Oh, well, that's all to do with my parents, I suppose. In a sense, as I say in my present book that I'm writing, I never grew up, really. I mean, you grow up by getting married and having children, basically, don't you? And I never grew up. Is that something so in a way, mm -hmm. the world is always um, a place of exploration because um, you're not settled in it, really. You're not, not exactly part of it. You're an observer of it. So do you miss that potential family life? Oh, children? yes. Yes, I think so. But on the other hand, I, I feel I wasn't suited to it, so it's best best avoided. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that my father was suited to family life, really. He did his best, I have to say now. You know, I mean, I used to be very critical, um, but now I realise he did as, as best he could. But he would have been happier as an independent man, really. Um, it must have been awful for him to have to work hard and turn up nearly all his money to, um, to keep a family going. Mm, but that respect, I think, comes through in the early novels and love of your mother, I think, also. Oh, comes yes. In fact, you write very beautifully and understandingly about women and I don't know how that's done when you haven't had close contact or family life. It's it's, it's a strange thing. Well, I identified with them very early on, that's why. Really, I identified with my mother very early on. And through her, with other women, um, her, her sisters and her, her, um, her family generally, and particularly her mother, who I never knew, she died quite young. Um, that comes into the coming work. Um, I never knew her, but I feel I knew her because my mother told me so much about her. I wonder, before we finish, if there's anything else you'd like to read. I, I mean, I'd like to hear the end of, of Maureen, but if you'd like to read another poem for us. Well, this is about death. <laughs> it's called Closure. <clears throat> what it is, I mean, but it's supposed to be amusing in a way because... It's about me and Benjamin. Benjamin was the dog of an aunt who lived in Maybank. And I used to walk him round Woolstanton. And I used to walk him in, this was in the 1970s, I suppose. Um, I used to walk him into um, the churchyard, you know, under the spire. Now people wouldn't understand the poem because what they would see from that churchyard is a sort of retail centre um, uh, and the, um, what's it, gardens, the um, festival yes. park. And when I was there you could stand behind a wonderful angel on one of the graves and look down and there were the trains going past. That's right, and, and the steelworks and the mine, mm. the pit and everything, yes. And that's what it's about, really. We walk among the comfortable dead, Benjamin and I, hunching our shoulders at the uncomfortable sky. The spire looks down on Benjamin and me as we look up through an unfrocked tree. We piddle on the gravestones, I and Benjamin, and shiver from tip to tail as ice closes in. The pit head illuminations spot Benjamin and myself, silhouetted with black urns 
above the men who delve. Now Benjamin and I pad thoughtfully home to bed, and like weary colliers lie among the comfortable dead. Thank you, John. Well, I always dedicate that to you as you live there. <laughs> yeah, well, so, this is about far. Uh, this, in a way, perhaps illustrates my um, sadistic tendencies or whatever, <laughs> as you will see by the ending. Something, oh, it's called Dead Heading. That's very important, the title. Dead Heading. Something leaves me sapless when the daffodils fade. An agony in gardens all the land over. The very first mass funeral of the year. And though it's only the first of many, with cornucopias to come, something still tears the heartstrings, strips them raw. Oh yes, the primroses persist, all right, elusive, tough and tantalising as those legendary blonde women while bluebells crowd in cool green naves, a convocation of bow peeps, each with her bishop's crook. And then the roses, those fast maturing Renoir maids, whose faces and pudenda look so worryingly alike, bland, plump confections of the pink and white and red, just waiting to be plucked as trophies for a male's display. It's usually women who are compared to flowers. What sort are daffodils, then, who give their all at the beginning, yet still, when fading, render one final satisfaction, like Henry's wives offering their necks to the chop? Well, I think that includes many of your themes there. I noticed the blonde women, which takes us back to Hollywood and, and the film stars and Renoir and your love of art. Again, there's quite a lot of references to painting yeah. in, in your novels yeah. and to, to male violence. So that was perhaps a summation as well. Yes. So thank you again. All right. <laughs>